slide, I've got a presentation for everyone on uh, introduction to pen testing. That's actually this is part one. Apparently, this is an older copy of my slides that doesn't list that, but no, that's fine. You have to do what's right, basically. You can't go off and hack into a computer that's not yours. That's when you become a blockhead and you know get caught. You go to jail for a long time, actually, because our, our computer laws are a little bit draconian in this country. So anyway, one of the main areas to look at is the ISC squared. Uh, their code of ethics. Uh, they've got a few basic points. One is to protect society, the common good, and ne necessary public trust and confidence in the infrastructure. Then there's acting honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally, providing diligent, competent services to your clients, and advancing and protecting professions. So I think those are all pretty straightforward. Another big point is to make sure you maintain privacy and confidentiality of your client. And if you're doing pen testing on something other than your own system, you need to acquire written permission from the appropriate authority, so the owners of that system. So you don't want to just be given verbal permission. You want to make sure that you've got written permission somewhere. Now, there's an example form. I don't have a link on here, but there's an example form on counterhack.com, I think it is. Uh, at any rate, if someone's interested in that, they can contact me and I can put that on. So, anyway, it's it's a very, very broad topic, though, ethics and pen testing. The legal system really hasn't caught up, like I said, but they're still making laws on it anyway, even though most of the people making them don't know what they're talking about. So, like I said, if you start getting into pen testing, you need to make sure that you follow your code of ethics very strictly and get written permission and just don't do anything stupid. Any questions? Yeah, that last part was the part that really um, Maybe Don't just a stupid. question for you, Eugene. Do you think it's um, justified, let's say, to like have like an email Nazi website or something like that? First of all, I like how this was a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> a question for you. At first, I thought he was going to go off. Have you ever hacked anyone illegally? <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> so, so, like, I mean, it's not a yes or no. I mean, but, obviously, but it's not a yes or no. The so question, just, like, feel. So, so usually, what happens when you see sites like getting that hacked? They're hacked by people who say, you know, they're they're trying to do justice, right? And they're usually Americans who claim to believe, believe in freedom of speech. True. So, according to our our country's so you're saying it's kind of just an inconsistency. Laws, according to our country's laws and legal rulings, the answer has always been unless you are using hate speech, or more importantly, something that will invoke uh, criminal activities, you have the right to say what you think. Whether people agree with it or not, it's of no issue. Mm -hmm. So, okay, interesting. Were there any other questions? All right, so what is pen testing? I suppose maybe this one should come before the ethics one, but I thought good to get the ethics done immediately. So. Uh, penetration testing, which is also known as ethical hacking, well, that's that's where you take the same techniques as hackers use to find weaknesses in systems. This can be done by the employees of an organization, or it can be done by a trusted third party, sometimes not all that trusted, because a lot of the people doing pen testing are currently people who went to jail at some point or another for hacking and have performed. Um, which is actually why, if you're into pen testing, you have a pretty good chance chance of getting a job, assuming you've never gone to jail, because there's not actually all that many good pen testers who have not broken the law in gaining their skills. So it's easier to be trusted, to be that trusted third party if you haven't ever broken the law. And it can be broken down into phases of text, specifically five. So are there any generic questions on what the broad definition of pen testing is? I'll be getting into details very shortly. So, so the first phase is reconnaissance. This is finding information about a target. Uh, generally, this is a really low level or a really low profile way to find information. Usually, you're not going to get spotted when you're doing this because you're not, say, scanning for ports. You're just, say, looking at the website uh, or even dumpster diving. Um, basically, at this point, you're trying to learn about the assets on the target's network, and you're utilizing uh, the fact that most organizations leak a lot of data. So the first way of approaching reconnaissance is getting information from the internet and from the trash. At any rate, sometimes websites have documents that are meant for internal consumption. Somebody just stuck something up on a server and they uh, really shouldn't have, or 
maybe even it's, it, it happens that the web server and the file server are all on the same machine, that would be unfortunate. And, you know, they happen to be you know, easy as a result to post things onto the website through the file sharing. Another one is employees sometimes post questions online uh, just asking for help on something. And this could actually reveal sensitive information about the network. Now, how do you get, say, documents like this? Well, obviously, the first place you're going to turn to is a search engine. Probably Google, if you're most people. If you're me, you use DuckDuckGo because it protects the privacy that you're using. And, you know, also, it, it doesn't make assumptions about what you're searching for in the same way Google does. You can, if you know how to write a search expression, it will actually let you write it instead of trying to assume it's smarter than you are with Google. It's a really big thing about it. So anyway, the, the way to do to look for, say, a document or a slideshow or Excel PowerPoint is you can use the file type operator, which is file type colon and then the extension for that file type. So if it's a PDF, you just put PDF. And then you put in your search terms. So you could actually combine that that file type operator with the site operator. Now, the site operator is when you do site colon and then the website address. So combine those two terms and you can find all the PDFs that are on a site or all the document, the Word document files that are on the site and so on and so forth. So obviously that can be kind of an easy way to get things. Uh, the, the other half of this equation, you know, from the web and from trash, is the trash. Well, dumpster diving can turn up uh, passwords, old CDs, manuals, lots of things because People don't think about the fact that your trash is sensitive, you know, you, or your trash can be rooted through. People can go into your trash and get things from it. This can become a real big problem when the employee, when an employee is moving because they tend to throw out a lot of things. There's actually um, information from like you know the 80s where there's they they were more open about the hacking back then, I guess, because you can go find a lot of stuff about it. But uh, I think it was there was probably AT and T got horribly compromised because they had left documents with passwords and whatnot in the trash. And they would have hackers who were coming through and going through the trash and retrieving all this information and using it to exploit the network. Any questions? So the next one is social engineering. The most common approach to social engineering is just talking your way in. If you, if you seem confident, you can probably get past the security of most human, uh, most organizations, because most organizations, that's just somebody sitting up at the front desk. Um, you know, acting like you belong is key. That's part of being confident. And uniforms can help as well. Because if you look like you're the UPS guy, there's a good chance they're just going to wave you on through, assuming, at least assuming you're carrying the package. Spoofing phone numbers as well. It, it turns out that a lot of people check their caller ID and they say, oh, hey, this is an internal number. I can trust this person. It's from the same organization as I am. So if you can spoof it, phone number, which is easy enough to do because there's services that let you do it, and there's also, you know, the potential of compromising a telephone exchange, then you can spoof an internal number. Then you just pretend you're somebody who actually works there, and then you say, you know, oh, I've forgotten this, or I've never been here before, so I don't know it. At, at any rate, you know, just make it sound like you're, you have a legitimate reason to be trying to get this information, and a lot of organizations will let it through. Questions? So the defenses to these things, well, user education, obviously, that's that's one that comes up pretty much all the time in security. If your users don't know what they're doing, they're going to do something stupid. Monitoring what information is, on, is allowed online, so obviously sensitive network, sensitive network details should not be online. Firm policies about destroying media, so when you're throwing out stuff, you should be shredding it if it's got any potentially sensitive media in it. And one of the ones that's really hard to do is strictly enforcing ID checking in your organization. So if, I can, if I've got an ID card to go work somewhere, it should be checked when I'm entering. Otherwise, there's really no point. If I just keep it in my pocket all, all the time, what's the point? Just having an RFID-enabled card that you touch through the door to let you in doesn't help much because somebody can always come in as that door is closing and slip back in through, which is called tailgating and probably happens more than you'd like to think. That and the fact that people just leave the doors open. But basically, unless you make it very clear to your employees that they can get fired or certainly have disciplinary action taken against them should they let someone in who shouldn't be let in, then they're probably going to do so. Are there questions about any of the reconnaissance stuff before we move to the, move to the next phase? So the second phase is scanning the target. This is really similar to reconnaissance, and in some respects you could kind of roll them into one, but it's, it's a lot more active. So at this point, you're, act, you're doing active scanning. You're doing things like looking for what ports are open on a system or they're or the firewall, 
and you're looking for vulnerabilities in the network. So the first type of scanning is word dialing. Now this is actually going through and calling phone numbers and seeing if a modem responds. Now it seems ridiculous that people are still using modems, but because it, it's easy for people to set up, sometimes they decide they don't want to have to deal with their IT and they just go set up a modem so they can get work from home. Well, that's a really bad thing because that means if I can call that number, I can get right into the network without having to deal with the network firewall or any other defenses on the network. If you need to work from home, then you need to get then you need to get like a VPN set up if you're allowed to do it at all. Some organizations won't allow you to do it at all. Anyway, the reason why war dialing is successful is because if you're targeting an organization, that organization has often been assigned a, a large block of telephone numbers, so they're sequential. So you just go through and you dial those phone numbers one after another or maybe in some other algorithm. And if you're using software to do it, you can check a few thousand numbers overnight. Once a successful connection is made, like I said, you can get direct access. So there's like there's almost no setup required for the attack if you're just in. Questions about war dialing? Anyone here actually used a modem? Maybe I just looped it. There we go. Now, war driving. Well, this is related in a lot of respects to war dialing, hence a similar name. This is when you take a laptop, a GPS, and generally a chauffeured car, because, you know, don't be distracted in the trust. <laughs> um, and you go around looking for open wireless access points. Now, when I say open, this could be totally unencrypted, or it could be using WEP, which is the same thing as being totally unencrypted. Um, a lot of users flat out don't set up wireless encryption on the networks because they don't understand or they're too lazy or they say, well, I don't need to do this. Unfortunately, this means that I can get access to your network, possibly bypassing your network firewall and many other restrictions. So, yeah, that doesn't work so well. Now, one of the defenses that a lot of people might try to turn to is turning off their wireless SSID. Now, that's basically the network name. doesn't work. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't work. You can detect it and get it in any way. There's a whole bunch of ways to detect it. There's a whole bunch of ways to get the SSID. I've actually played with stuff before. It's really easy. It's just click a button, wait a few minutes, and it'll pick up the SSID, even if it's in. So I don't even bother with it. I mean, there's the argument about layered security, but quite frankly, if you're using WPA2, it is going to stop everybody who can find the SSID as well as everybody who can't. So just yeah. use the proper protection in the first place. Questions? Well, we're going through this surprisingly fast. All right, so some of the tools that are used in scan, port scanners, these let you find out usually what TCP ports are being are open, so they, these are the TCP ports that will respond to a connection attempt. You'll also get some that can do UDP. Uh, there's another thing called firewalk. This is a technique, I think it's just flat out a technique, but there is a program implementing a call firewall, and this looks to see what ports are open in a firewall. Finally, there are vulnerability scanners which look for exploitable vulnerabilities existing on the network already. I have a question. Sure. Is firewall the um, kind of system on the computer, the application on the computer that prevents like all ports from being open? Or that's, I guess, one of the things? There are two types of firewall. Okay. One is what you just described. It will monitor, it, it can, at the very least, it can say nothing can access this port. Okay. So it just, Anytime a packet comes in that is directed towards that port, it rejects it. Alternatively and better is, because that's the that blacklisting approach, what you really want to do is whitelist, which is where you go through and say, these are the only ports that I want to allow. There are more sophisticated firewalls that look at what application is receiving what data. Um, they check to make sure that the, the application, that something from that computer sent out a connection, requested a connection, rather than somebody requesting a connection. Right. The other type of firewall is a network firewall. That's something that lives sometimes on your router. Certainly it's at the outside of your network because there's no point if it's a machine that doesn't get all the traffic. Right. But all the traffic is routed through it. It also blocks ports. Basically it's really similar but it operates on an entire network level. So you want to have both types of firewall if at all possible. That makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. You want to have something that examines the packets as well as something that examines the ports. Well, there's actually a lot of different approaches to firewalls. Now, what's interesting is if you talk about examining the packets, well, that starts turning into almost an IDS. IDS, depending on how much you examine them. Now, IDS is an intrusion detection system. 
Right. Um, firewalls usually don't go that in depth on examining the packets. Now they may act as a proxy though. Now there's such a thing as an application proxy, which is where you've got a firewall that basically you connect to it for say email or internet, and it filters all the internet. Uh, there's also aside from just blocking ports, um, stateful firewalls, which are basically like I said, they're the kind that should say. Is this connection that somebody requested, or is this somebody gratuitously trying to make a connection? Yeah. And they can reject the ones that are new connections. But there are ways around yeah. all of them. Yeah. Anything else? All right. So Nmap. Nmap is one of the more common TCP and UDP scanners. Uh, if you've ever watched The Matrix, you've seen it for just a, a brief moment. It's actually in, I think, the opening scene. It's being used by Trinity. Um, so, it, it, NMAP is short for Network Mapper, as you might have guessed. Um, it can do some nifty things. It can attempt to detect what services open on a port or what version, even the operating systems. To detect what service and version might be off open on a port, you, you look for the banner. Now, a banner is what gets sent back if I attempt to open a connection on a port. Not everything sends a banner, but like SSH might send something that identifies itself as an SSH server if I attempt to connect to port 22. The way it identifies operating systems is TCP IP stacks are different between most operating systems. Most operating systems have different implementations of them. So Windows is a really crappy one. Um, Linux has a different one. BSD has a different one. Cisco has its own. Everybody has their own TCP IP stack. And they all work a little bit differently. And as a result, I can run things that make, make it possible for me to guess what it is. I can't always get 100%, but I, may, I can often guess the operating system. I may even be able to guess down to the version. Uh, it can also perform some network mapping. Now, that's when you go in and you, you ping a whole bunch of different computers within the network, and you try to figure out the organization of the network using trace routes and pings and everything. NetMap, NetMap isn't actually all that good of a network mapper. Cheops, I think that's how you say it, is better because it's a dedicated one, but NMAP is something a lot of people have on hand. Now, if you're interested in NMAP, the other thing to look at is called ZenMap, Z-E-N-M-A-P, and it's, it's just a graphical interface for it, and it's, they describe it as providing training wheels to NMAP, because NMAP is a command line interface, and it's a bit rough to learn the first time. Questions? So just a few examples. Um, the first is performing a ping scan for an entire network to see what's on it. That's nmap-sn. Now, and then your IP for the network. Um, the S is a switch for scanning, and the N just means ping. Um, the next example I've got, and these are just a few examples. There's a lot more you can do with this. The next one would be the OS and version for a particular target, since we talked about that. Dash nmap dash a dash t4 and then the IP address of the target you want to learn the OS of. The dash a means to detect the OS and the version of the dash t4 is a uh, switch that says to go a little bit faster. Uh, then I've got one on scanning a UDP port or UDP ports using fragmented packets. Uh, that's nmap dash su dash f and then the target. Now the dash su means to scan UDP and the dash f means to fragment. Now. Does everybody understand what I mean when I say fragment packets? Okay, so in the IP protocol, I can there is a there is part part of the header says that you can fragment packets because IP is meant to go over a whole bunch of different types of networks. So some networks, like say some routers, can only handle say a, a ten byte packet. Now this is just a totally random random made up number. And, but maybe another one can handle 100 one. So when that 100 byte packet hits the 10 byte router, obviously that's a big problem, right? Right. So the 100 byte router can say that this can be fragmented and it can just break it into 10 pieces. Gotcha. And so that's what fragmentation means. Now the thing and about, that's the server itself that performs it usually. I, I, it's going to depend. I think it's probably done based on the router knowing who comes after it. You'd have to look into it if you want to know the exact yeah. details. Um, now the reason why you might want to fragment packets like that is because they can make it harder to detect what's going on, because they make, basically they make things more confusing. So if I'm the intrusion detection system, I have to know how the operating system reassembles a packet to put everything back together and see what's going on. And that basically means I have to implement the TCP IP stack for any operating system on the network I'm guarding. 
Any questions? So Firewalk and Nessus. Firewalk, I already mentioned slightly, it maps a network from a remote location. It uses trace route to detect when a firewall kicks in. Now that's important information because if I can reach a computer behind the firewall but I can't reach it with all the ports I'd like, being able to figure out where that firewall is can help. Now how do I do that? Well, what, what firewall, Firewalk is doing is it's setting trace route. Now trace route is an ICMP com uh, protocol command. ICMP is the Internet Control Message Protocol. What that's doing, that includes things like ping as well. In case anyone's not familiar with it, I'm guessing everybody's probably familiar with ping. So what it does is it says, okay, I'm going to allow this packet to do one hop, and a hop is each time it hits a router. So it can do one hop before it fails and is sent back and says it's failed. Then I'll do two hops, then three hops, then four hops. So eventually, if you're being blocked by a firewall for this type of packet, you get blocked, right? So it jumps, and, and it'll get just dropped. It doesn't return and say it failed, it just drops. You know, So eventually, it'll jump far enough to where it stops getting returns, and that's going to be the point where the firewall exists. And it can also figure out what ports are being blocked by a firewall, but anyway. Now, Nessus is a proprietary, although there is a free version that's non commercial, vulnerability scanner. What a vulnerability scanner does is it literally scans the network and looks for known security holes that somebody can exploit. And it just gives you a list of all the ones it found. So, to prevent Nessus from being affected from an attacker, you can use patching and an IDS. And of course, obviously, all these tools are really useful for scanning your own network to see where your problems are and try to fix them. Are there questions? All right, so phase three, that's exploits and compromises. This is the stage where an attacker gains the actual control of a machine on a target network. This is probably what everybody's thinking of when they hear the term hacker. So an operating system attack allows you to gain control over individual systems, whereas a network attack lets you gain access into that network. And then from there, usually you're going to start attacking the individual operating systems. Individual. Uh, and a DOS attack simply takes machines or services offline. So a network attack, by the way, the reason why that might give you a good entry point into it, if you can, say, place a sniffer on the network, then it will give you credentials or potentially other sensitive data, but that's coming up all in our history. Okay, so... I'm still not getting this. Okay, how is it that a network... How is it that a operating system attack does not give you network control, to, to some extent at least? So I can, I can have a network attack that I can do without an operating system attack. So I don't necessarily have to have to have had attack an operating system to perform a network attack. I may just be able to plug in with my own computer and start going through the network. And you'd still be able to maybe say, like, well, from this packet here to this packet there. I'm not sure what you mean. Let's say on a specific network. You're saying that you could still gain control of a network without gaining control of yeah, you, you can get some okay. degree of control over it. You can't, I mean, it's, usually what you're looking for is like credentials so you can gain control over individual systems. Okay. So network attack may lead to operating system attacks, but the two do not necessarily go hand in hand. They can't be exclusive. I may never bother exploiting an uh, operating system because I may be able to get everything I want using the network. Exactly. I may be able to sit there with a sniffer and gather up yeah. all that private data about Luke's lasers, and, you know, then I don't need to attack a computer. The only, the only way that one would be able to do that is if the network did not have encryption in it. Not necessarily. If they had a weak form of encryption or if they were able to gain access to the key, then they could still sniff the traffic. Okay. But so, and I mean, that's not the only form of network attack, but we're, we're going to get to the network attacks later. Probably, like I said, probably not tonight, but... So, operating system attacks. Um, the basic ones are, this This is just a general overview, there's more depth slides coming. The overview is there's you know buffer overflow exploits, these can allow remote code ex execution, which is literally where I run an attack and I'm able to insert my own code onto the target system. Password guessing, well that's obvious, I just try to figure out your password. Malicious web applications or scripts can seize control of your computer when you're browsing with the internet, over, over the internet. And uh, SQL injection target servers using relying on SQL databases. So the first category is buffer overflow exploits. There are two basic types of stack buffer overflow called smashing the stack sometimes. 
This is when I try to overwrite a local variable near uh, in the buffer to alter the execution of the program. So usually this will be a local variable at the end of a stack, and I will um, overflow it because it didn't have protection on it, and I'll be able to overwrite the return address and point to what it, make that return address point to whatever I want. A heap over, uh, buffer overflow is just as dangerous as a stack buffer overflow. This just this one can overwrite function pointers that exist in memory. So a function pointer is just a pointer like you might normally have to a variable, except it's actually going to a pointer. And this can just be changed to point to attacker's code. So it's very similar to changing a return pointer. And it can let attackers access the user data within the heap of the program, because most data goes on the heap rather than the stack. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, the stack is typically on the CPU, or the heap is typically in the RAM? No. No, it's both are in RAM usually. Okay. So a, a stack, I mean, there might be well, CPUs that I have would a, think the stack would be on the cache. And the, I, I'm sure there are some CPUs that way, and I believe there's probably a small stack on the cache. Okay. But no, the stack that we're referring to is in RAM. It's also in RAM, okay. So there, there may be a different one on the CPU that, yeah, I think there probably is, but that's not what we're referring to. But it may all depend on the operating system. Too. Well, well, the stack in this case is not is not your stack that is dealing with your commands. Mm -hmm. This is a stack that you have, you write variables to. So like local right. variables get written to the stack, and then obviously function return addresses. So when I've called a, a sub-process a function, obviously at the very end of that function in the assembly code, there has to be a return command to point me back to where I'm starting at. Right. And so what we're targeting is that return address and try to override it. Uh, now when you guys say, um, let's say a stack and a CPU or a stack in RAM, if it's in RAM, do you mean like the code that's written to implement the stack? No, I'm right, talking about what's actually in the stack. Because remember, oh, okay. the, the, the stack is just information, it's not the code itself. Right. Yeah, so okay. each, the stack is broken down into, you know, it is, well, kind of sort of broken down into pieces. Conceptually, I think of it in blocks, right? You've got right. your main block, and then let's say I, I call a function called Hello World. So there's a Hello World block. Yes. And that block has got a whole bunch of different data. The activation variables. Is that the term? What? I don't know. Okay, that's fine. I, I, I think it's usually called the stack frame. Okay. And at the very end of this stack frame or block is a return pointer pointing back. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to hit that point re return pointer and overflow it and go back. So this is something hopefully we can do a, a special presentation at some point, go into more in depth, maybe write a couple of programs that do these exploits and show them off. Because um, it is an interesting topic and it's somewhere that a lot of attacks occur. Would that require like a ton of function calls to actually overflow? I think the amount of RAM that it's well, on to. If I remember correctly, how stack grows down correctly, correct? It'll depend. I think in V23. Most things it grows down. Yeah, it grew down. So, so what you're trying to do, when you're not actually overflowing the return pointer in your current stack, if I remember correctly. You're actually doing it from the previous function. Because as you overwrite the memory, it goes up. So as you're going past where you're supposed to be, what, what can happen, what literally is happening, mm -hmm. usually or one of the most common attacks, is I've got a C array, and I take user input as a character array, character array usually. I take user input, and I use the, I think it's fgit, maybe. I'd have to look it up. Anyway, mm -hmm. what it literally does is it takes anything from input or from another buffer, and starting at that starting address of that array, it yeah. puts all the data in. So even if I overflow about 100 characters, all of that data is going into memory. I see. Anything else? So obviously doing that would be a bit of a pain. You have to write assembly, you have to do all sorts of testing to figure out where these buffer flow exploits exist. So you want to automate the process. Um, so what what is involved in automating the process? Well, first off, you want to identify individual vulnerabilities on a target so that you can tell which exploit to use and uh, how time consuming it might be. Um, so one of the most common tools for doing this is called Metasploit. This maps the vulnerabilities that it finds. It can actually include vulnerabilities that were found by Nmap or Nessus to the appropriate exploit within Metasploit. It then List those exploits from the best chance of executing to the worst chance of executing correctly. 
to help you choose which attack is going to be the fastest to hit. Now, the other thing is it's actually modular in design, so you can create your own exploit and use an existing payload so that you don't actually have to write the assembly code. You can just find the exploit, where the weakness is, and then using these tools, create a new exploit to well, exploit it. Um, and, you know, it's much quicker than having to go in and having to remember back to your assembly class and to figure out how to write it, you know, figure out how to execute, say, NCAT, you know, which we talked about making a backdoor of NCAT before, or figuring out how to launch something else like that. It's, it's, a, it's a big time saver for attackers. Questions? Uh, by the way, Metasploit is another one that hopefully at some point we'll come back and talk about in the future. So here's just a, a screenshot of the MSF console in Metasploit. And it's showing the exploits that it's found. And you can see it's got the name of the overflow in the far left. Then it's got the date, I believe that's of the date it was originally found. And then it's got that listing of which ones are likely to run or not. So you've got excellent, you've got good. I think there's probably a poor one in there. Oh, I guess not. But there's an average one. So, you know, somebody thinks, I wonder what the difference is between average and poor. Anyway, and then finally, it gives a few more details about the actual exploit. Um, questions on Metasploit? I guess not, since I already talked about it. All right, so the next type of attack is password guessing. Well, the most obvious approach is to just do a brute force attack. That's where I try to guess every possible character combination for that pop password. This is really time consuming if it's got a, if there's a long password because the possibilities of character combinations grow exponent, exponentially with respect to the password length. So if I've got a 100 character password, you're probably not going to be able to break it, ever. Doesn't matter how many machines you have. Um, I mean, unless you have fancy new technology. But anyway, um, <laughs> with knowledge of the target's password, then you can shorten this, this process a lot. So if you use a process, I might be able to figure out what your process is and use that to shorten my, turn, my time in guessing it. I can also often guess a list of well-known passwords that are you know really common and do that. I think, uh, I can't remember what the most common is anymore. Anyway, uh, the next area would be account harvesting. That's where you go get a whole bunch of email addresses and other possible usernames from sources on the internet or otherwhere, and then use them in a phishing attack to try to get more personal information from the target. The other thing you can use this for is when you're on the login page, if you know that a username is valid or invalid based on what it responds to, it greatly reduces the number of available combinations that you have to guess. So then all you're guessing is a password instead of password and username. So if, for those of you who ever go write a login portal, don't tell me if my username or if my password failed, just tell me that my login failed. In other words, the, the term that's usually used is fail silently. So both of these processes are usually going to be automated. Obviously, you don't want to sit there and guess A. A, B, A, B, C, uh, for $2,000, because you're way slower than the computers at guessing. Uh, anyway, Backtrack, apparently the current versions of Backtrack have tools that are useful for both those types of attacks. Backtrack is, by the way, a, a whole bunch of existing security tools all piled into one Linux distribution. Questions? All right, so compromising the web browser. Well, we mentioned this slightly. There's the first type would be like cross. The first most common type would be cross site scripting. That's when I inject a malicious script into a trusted website, usually using a browser side script, and then send it into another user. So that's that's literally I've inserted code from another website into a legitimate website to try to trick somebody into executing that code. The end user browser then executes the malicious script. Now. There's also some other things like ActiveX especially used to have a really bad reputation for a really good, well, for a really bad reason. There was a good reason that it was, had a bad reputation. And that was because it would allow you to do all sorts of things like execute programs on the disk. And they didn't have their security controls locked down very well. So a lot of times I might be able to execute malicious code using ActiveX directly on the computer. I could execute anything, I could read files, stuff like that. So. Fortunately, ActiveX is no longer as popular, at least as far as I can tell. Oh, and by the way, the, the major threat through cross-site scripting is going to be like somebody finds out your cookies, which may give up a password or at least access to an account. 
Then there is SQL. Oh, was there any questions on cross-site scripting or other web browser attack? Okay, well, SQL injection, probably this is a bad title, but oh well, for compromising a web browser. So SQL injection allows me to spoof my identity or alter and change in any other, well, change data in a database, an SQL database, whether that be to delete it, change it, add things to it. So what it's literally doing is there's a, a language called SQL that's standard query language. And it's used a lot on websites because I can insert, you know, I, I can query a database and get back information from it using that. So there's a couple of ways to use this. And the, the, the bad way to use this is when you literally just pass it a string. Because then as an attacker, I can go rewrite that string or I can insert sub commands into it because you can literally in SQL create Subqueries, that's the word I'm looking for. Subqueries that could say delete data or anything. I could insert that into, into an existing query and then, you know, I, I might have made myself a new user, maybe an administrator to that website, all sorts of things. That's um, assuming uh, that, like, the software giving you that form isn't properly. Yeah, written. that assumes it's not sanitizing. Yes, right. That's, that's the major, well, that's one of two defenses. One is sanitizing, one is using parameterized SQL, which is where you Literally, you have in your SQL statement variables, so all that can be changed are those variables, and they will only accept a certain length string, yada, yada, yada. This is, again, Is that where you bind values to certain strings? Basically, I think. It's I believe. It. I think that's, I know what you're talking about. Anyway, this is something that's really well known, and everybody should be defending against, but they seem to be really common anyway. SQL injections are really common. If you're interested in learning about that, there's a useful tool called WebGo which is literally a vulnerable website that you can put up and it, it has lessons in it to step you through how to exploit it. Um, and this is actually supported by OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, which is a really useful resource as well. Are there any questions? So some of the defenses against these attacks I just talked about, strong passwords is a biggie, so obviously that deals with passwords. I already talked about failing silently. <laughs> Keeping your systems updated and patched with the latest fixes from the vendors. That way the exploits don't work. Using an intrusion detection system. There's an open source one called Snort. That is again something else I want to go in more in depth at at some point, but it could be a while. And especially also using parameterized SQL. I mentioned that as well. So we talked about that. And that totally seals off the possibility of SQL injection. Are there any questions about operating system level defenses? All right, so that pretty much closes it up. Here are some references. Counter Hack Reloaded. I highly recommend this book. It's it is not it will, you won't be able you won't come out of this with the ability to go download the software and run the exploits. What you will come out with is the understanding of how stuff works. And honestly, in my opinion, that's more more valuable than being able to use the current version of a piece of software. It's more valuable to learn the skills and be able to apply them on any version of software or to make your own exploits to know what you're doing. And of course, understanding it helps you in defending against the same thing. So a lot of the books out there are literally just telling you, here's how to use Metasploit. Not so great. Nmap, I give a link to their website. They have some documentation there. Firewalk, link to the website. Again, Packet Storm Security in this case. We, that's actually come back up before in the last meeting. We talked, we went to there and talked to it a little bit. Um, Nessus Vulnerability Scanner, ISC2 Code of Ethics, the ECA, EC Council, that had a little bit more ethics information on it as well. And then I mentioned the Open Web Application Security Project. So are there any questions about the presentation as a whole? This is, as I said, part one. Part two will be next week. It will cover network attacks. Technically, it covers maintaining access, but because we've already done the malware presentation, <coughs> it's one slide. And it talks about covert, covert channels and other ways of uh, hiding evidence that you've attacked the system.